guaranteed. Visit arnoldclark.com. Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show, sponsored by Arnold Clark. I'm Peter Martin, Alan Ruff, Tammy McManus and Mark McGee are here with us. We decided to give you a real flavour of what League Cup semi-final weekend is about. Somebody who's won it, somebody who's got a great you know, success in the campaign and somebody who's just a blatant loser. And that's why Tam's here alongside Mark McGee and Alan Ruff on this League Cup semi-final weekend. Tam, absolutely great to see you. And, and I have to say, you know you're going to get caned for that top that you've got on today as well um, but uh, nevertheless good to have you with us there's lots to talk about uh, down south there is the FA Cup as well uh, to look forward to uh, so give us your thoughts give us your thoughts on your team we'll be looking at the two league games in the Scottish Premiership as well as Rangers get a chance to go further ahead and of course we'll hear from Stephen Gerrard on his transfer targets don't forget follow us on our Facebook, share the stream with your pals, subscribe on our YouTube. Thank you to the thousands upon thousands who are joining us week in, week out. The figures are absolutely magnificent. Thank you for that. Okay, before we get into the meat and bones of the opinion of our pundits here, uh, let's see what it's all about. Gabriel Antoniazzi looks ahead to the two semi-finals. An unorthodox year, an unorthodox League Cup. Here we are at the semi-final stage with four teams that perhaps wouldn't have expected to be here, but that all now think they can win it. On Saturday, it's favourites Hibernian against St Johnston. Now, Hibs have won this trophy three times before, most recently in 2007. Manager Jack Ross is happy with his side's form coming into the game, but he's wary of their struggles at the semi-final stage in recent years. Who could forget their 2-1 loss against Hearts here back on Halloween? Now, Ross is hoping that the pain from that defeat can spur them on to victory tomorrow. I don't think it's as big because we lost the last one. It's big because we want to get to the final. Um, you know, I've been in a few semi-finals now as a manager. That was the first one I think I've lost as a, as a manager, a semi-final. And I, I, it's, a, it's sore. I said that after the time. It's sore and it's painful. And again, the choices for us was, was not wanting to get there again for fear of having that pain or having the drive to get there to make sure you give yourself the chance of having that feeling of elation. So for us, it's just about the game in isolation. It's about it being another step towards achieving one of our ambitions for the season. Now, St Johnson are Hibs' first top flight opposition in this competition, while the Saints themselves knocked out Motherwell before beating Dunfermline on penalties in the quarter final. They've never won the cup before, but they've taken confidence from their first win in 10 last weekend. The last match between the two sides was 2 all, and a strong sense performance in that one has given boss Callum Davidson confidence for Saturday. I think it's obviously going to be a tough game, but I've watched all the games back. We played against Hibs this season. I think the boys have played really well against them. Probably unlucky not to get you know, a win or a draw here or there against them. So I think it's that gives me sort of belief and hope you know, that we can, we can go and do something. But I think we need to make sure we're all fully... The good news for me is that obviously I've got everybody back, everybody fit everybody available for the team so uh, everyone's I can tell everyone's desperate to play. Now Sunday's tie is perhaps more intriguing when the draw was made St Mirren were favourites after a fantastic end to 2020 but now it's Livingston they're unbeaten in 10 under new manager David Martindale and flying with confidence uh, he believes that his side can go through uh, it may be the biggest game of many of their lives and he doesn't want it to become a missed opportunity. It is about not letting the occasion pass you by, but not letting the occasion get the better of you. Now, it's trying to get that happy medium, I would have, suppose, with the players. But that's all I've been speaking about. Don't don't let the occasion pass you by, because you are in a cup semi-final at the National Stadium. It's a big occasion, but go and embrace it. Go and embrace it and go and be positive. Both sides have won the tournament this millennium. St Mirren did it in 2013. They were captained by current head coach Jim Goodwin. And who would back against them now? They knocked Aberdeen out in the last 16 and Rangers in the quarter-final. Here's what Goodwin makes of it all. I would love to sit here and tell you there's going to be five or six goals in the game and um, it's going to be a, a really entertaining evening. But I would expect it to be a, a really close, um, hard-fought game. And, um, you know, hopefully, like I say, you know, we come out on top again. And I would uh, I'll snap the hand off you right now for uh, a repeat of the 1-0 the scoreline in the league. So only two teams will be back here at the end of February with a chance to become heroes. And in such a strange season, all four sides believe it can be them. Yeah, uh, Hibs, out and out favourites. Mm. No surprise, Ruffy. Have they got more than enough uh, across the park 
uh, to be uh, into that final in February? Yeah, I think they have. Uh, we all know about the boy Doyle. Uh, Nisbet's uh, in a big occasion, he's coming up with a goal, you know, and uh, I think overall they've got players midfield who, who are good going forward. If Newell's playing, he's been a uh, surprise package this year as well. So, no, I think I think Hibs have got more match winners than St. Johnson. Uh, and I think uh, the disappointment, obviously, losing to Hearts in the other semi-final, which should be the motivation for them. And I still think they should have won that game. It hadn't been for Tam's wonder boy missing a penalty and uh, Craig Gordon obviously having these three fantastic saves. I think Hibs would have went through that night. So I, I think they'll continue to to win. Uh, I, I think, that, as I said, they've got, they've got goal scorers in their team more than St. Johnston. So I, I think it's a Hibs win for me. <laughs> Yeah, it looks a foregone conclusion, um, but uh, three wins in 14 for St. Johnson doesn't exactly uh, fill the Saints fans with any great confidence. They haven't really hit any great form as yet, Tom. Is this the moment? No, I think it'll be a very tight game. Listen, the two games between the teams have been at both games. Hibs won with a late penalty up at McDermott Park, one nothing, and then two each at Easter Road. So the games have been very tight. Um, I think St. Johnson have been unlucky a few times. On that run, not to, not to pick up the win. They were unlucky not to beat Dundee United whilst in the Shankland Wonder goal, which cost them a win. So I think it'll be really tight. I think Hibs will just edge it. I think they've just got a wee bit more quality in the forward areas. And I think that might just shade it for Hibs, but it'll be a really hard game. Yeah, interestingly enough, um, I just before I go to Mark, uh, Tom, uh, Scott Allen suddenly emerging as possibly um, an addition to the squad. What great news that would be. Oh, fantastic news. Uh, I spoke to Scott a couple of weeks ago um, when I was through at Easter Road and I know he's been working hard behind the scenes to get his fitness back up. Um, listen, everything's been kept private about what his problem was, but now he's back training, he's, he's back fit. I think that'll give the squad a massive boost. He's got so much quality. Even if he comes on with 10, 15 minutes to go, he can open up a defence for a pass or you know, a wee bit of class in the final third. So I think it's great news for Hibs fans. Gives them a boost along with obviously Jackson Irvin come in, Chris Carden. So they're starting to get bodies back into that midfield area and that can only augur well for the future for competition for places Yeah, I'm a huge fan Mark McGee of Scott Allen and the reason for that is because I like midfielders who actually, I know this sounds really really strange, but I like midfielders who actually play the ball forward uh, into strikers like uh, yourself I mean, that it sounds simple enough, but there's many a midfielder who's made a career out of playing the ball sideways yeah, safety first. Um, I mean, apart from the, the, the desire to play it forward, you know, you need to be able to see that pass forward in between the lines or, you know, down the side of defenders. And one of the things I always say to, to, to midfield players is that um, the strikers need the ball when they need it. You know what I mean? So if my movement's right as a striker and I come off the centre half, then I need the ball. You know, and one of the things with Scott is that he's capable of that. You know, he's capable of delivering the ball for the striker when they need it. And, you know, that's an asset for, for the team. Yeah. And the other thing about it as well, Mark, and we've watched this over the last few weeks as and we'll talk about Rangers and Celtic and their problems. And, and of course, players, when you get to a semi-final, I mean, David Martindale says, don't let the occasion pass you by. Um you know what it's like playing at that level, going on, winning in cup finals. Sometimes I think it's the players who are brave with the pass. There's an easy option in a pass, but then there's the brave one, the one who wants to play that ball forward, play it into areas instead of going for the easy one. It's all right keeping possession, but I think that the, the, the ones who actually make the difference are the ones who want to take that opportunity and that chance to play the killer pass. Yeah, but I think that um, all of that, you know, um, stems off of setting the stage for that, you know, in the sense of how the team approaches the game and how the, 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 the strategy, what the strategy and what the tactics are. Um, you know, so for instance, I think if both teams go out and they both play as well as they possibly can, Hibs will win the game. So St. Johnson have to find a way of undermining Hibs' ability to play as well as that. And if they let them play as well as that and Hibs gain that sort of bit of confidence, then you start to see players do what you're talking about, to make those forward passes, to take risks. But apart from anything else, they're playing in an area of the park, the opposition half, where it's less critical that if you make a mistake or you give the ball away. 
So, you know, I think that the, 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 the stage has to be set to give those creative players the opportunity to be make those sort of passes. Yeah, OK, Mark's going for a Hibs win. I'm going for a Hibs win. Tam, what about yourself? Yeah, I think Hibs will win 2-1. I think it'll be tight, but I just think Hibs have got just a wee bit more quality in the final third. Yep. Uh, Ruffy, what's your scoreline? Because Tam and I have included the two semi-finals in the predictor, Ruffy, just so that you're yeah. clear on this. What's your prediction yeah. on this? Can I can I just can I just get something clear as well? Is this over <coughs> ninety minutes or is it over the Aye. whole game? No, Peter Peter yeah, done yeah, it. Yeah, we've got any confusion. I know, I know, here? honestly. Mark, he's what 69. is it? Is it ninety he's, minutes of the game? Not... It's, it's, it's the whole, whole it's the whole game, game Ruffy. It's the whole game. The whole game. Right. Okay. Whole game. Right. So done I'm that going to for a, a Hibs <laughs> two 0 win. <laughs> yeah, um, Mark. There is an old saying that you know you you will always remain young if you act young. And I. Think right. I was going to say. Ruff... <laughs> it's more like still game. You know, every week he becomes. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard this, well, Peter. What, what did you go for, Peter? Uh, two one, two one to Hibs. Two one. So it's two two one. Two one. Yeah. Okay. To be fair, um, I never say Hibs. Did you not? You said I think Hibs over no. the piece. Oh, you did. No, oh, you no, did. I never. Oh, I, I, oh you he, did. He, 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 he's rewind. Rewind. Yeah, rewind. rewind. What, what I <laughs> said. <laughs> what I said was, if both teams can play, both teams play as well as they can, Hibs will win the game. And St. Okay. Johnson have to undermine that. That's what I said. Now, if St. Johnson well, can undermine that, then they can win the game. Well, on that note, let's have your prediction for St. Johnston then. Yeah. St. Johnson to win? I'll back St. Johnson. Yep. Give me this give me your prediction in the score. One nil. Okay, there you are. Took a bit of time, but we got it out of him, Ruffy. Write it down, because <laughs> we're not letting him away with it at the end of it all. Um, okay, uh, just out of curiosity, I, I mean, listen, I had a chat this morning with David Martindale. He's a really infectious character. He's got a brilliant backstory. I mean, listen, um, you're talking about a man that had, um, you know, trouble uh, in his early life with the police, um, you know, convicted, in jail, back out now trying to be accepted as a reformed uh, man, uh, accepted as a fit and proper person with the SFA to manage Livingston. So he's he's gone through the mill, um, and everybody, I think, is of the opinion that I've spoken to uh, that everybody deserves a second chance. He is unbeaten in 10 games um, as caretaker and manager of Livingston. Um, and it, it was just, it was great listening to him this morning. I did ask him though, Tom, and I wonder if you can shed any light on this. Mark will definitely with Fergie. But I said to him, you know, with all that you've gone through in your life, have you delivered, you know, any one of those speeches that's inspirational, you know, looking at, you know, from a movie or whatever. And he said, don't worry about it, Peter. He says, I, I actually have tried the old any given Sunday speech. He says, but we, we get cuffed down at Stranraer or Stenhouse Muir, so it clearly didn't work. I just wonder, Tam, have you had one of those motivational movies or something that somebody's got to stir you in a game? I've, I've, I've had two. I've had two. One, one was with Tony Mowbray, his first game for Hibs. He came in, they showed us the Any Given Sunday movie. We played Kilmarnock at home in the first game of the season and uh, we could beat one nothing, so that gets scrapped. And another one was <laughs> Alan Kernahan. Alan Kernahan, we were at playing for Dundee against Gretna in the semi-final of the Scottish Cup. And oh, he also played it the night before, the any given Sunday, and I thought, oh, I've seen this movie before, literally. <laughs> and, we get, and, we get, <laughs> and we get pumped again, 3 nothing. So I, I never, more, I never want to hear that speech again, to be honest. <laughs> I, 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 had a, I had one. We played uh, uh, Wigan and, uh, with Brighton, and Wigan were flying at the top of the league. And I gave this absolutely outstanding pre-match talk. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the goalkeeper, uh, Michelle Michel Kuypers, um, said to me in the way out of the dressing room, he says, Gaffer, he says, the hairs in the back of my neck and all that were stand on an end. He said, that was outstanding. Three nothing down after twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and Bob Booker, Bob Booker, my assistant, turns to me and he says, "You know, so much for rousing speeches. Three nothing down after twenty minutes. It's the best team talk I ever gave in my life." Yeah, Ruffy, 
Was there ever a wee Bertie uh, talk that inspired uh, you? Uh, <laughs> I can't remember then. I can remember a few Bertie things, obviously, half time and all that. I've told you the, I've told you the Bobby Houston one with the Subutio board, uh, with a Subutio board mark, uh, and all the wee wobbly Subutio players on it. And at half time, he used to come in, and uh, he start moving people about. And this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. And wee Pat Quinn was his assistant. <laughs> And uh, he says to me, Pat, have you got anything to say, Pat? And Pat came forward and he says, well, I, I think uh, Bobby Houston uh, could give us a wee bit more width on the left. And we bet he walked forward <laughs> and flicked the Bobby Houston subuto right off the board. <laughs> and he went, he's no playing the second half. <laughs> <laughs> flicked it right off the board. <laughs> but we, the other um, one, the other one's a lamp that, the other one's a John Lambie one with a pigeon, you know, and I, I, with, uh, with uh, Mark, you know that John Lambie was into the pigeons and I came in at half time in a game and things weren't going particularly well. And I tell you what, if you don't all get your finger out, this is what's going to happen to you at the end. And he went into his inside pocket and he had a deep pigeon, pigeon and he threw it in the middle of the dressing room <laughs> <laughs> as a threat. As a threat. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I can I, just can I just enlighten everybody? The pigeon had died of natural. Pain. I was going to say that <laughs> John, suffocation, John, not suffocation, yeah. from suffocation. No. John was John was not a pigeon killer. Let me tell you, he absolutely loved his pigeons. Anyway, um, apart from anything else, um, you've got to be singing the praises. Mark, have you been amazed at what Livingston have been producing? Unbelievable, you know, game after game, um, you know, and, and and you've described the manager's background as well, you know, you know. I remember one of the things that Fergie used to always do. He used to, you know, drip feed us Shankly, you know, quotes and Shankly tapes and all that sort of thing. And Shankly talks about it not not being important what way you do it. There's no right way. It's just important that you have a way and that you make your players understand what that is. And clearly, that's what's happening there. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a brilliant way to look at it. Um, uh, I thought for a minute there, I thought for a minute there in your speech, you were about to say it doesn't matter what we, but as long as you win. And I thought I'm going to correct him here because he absolutely slaughtered the Aberdeen players for a four-one Scottish Cup win over Rangers oh. because he didn't win the right way. Am I right, Matt McGee? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What did you yeah. feel like when he said only Miller and McLeish were half decent that day? No, no, he didn't, he didn't even say that. He said that Miller, only Miller and McLeish, you know, were responsible in any shape or form for winning the game. No. Um, oh, listen, we were used to it, you know. <laughs> we'd heard as bad, you know, often, you know. So it was no surprise to us. We went up to uh, St Andrews that night and stayed at the Old Course Hotel and we had a lovely night and... Uh, uh, Dick Donald get it all going and you know we, we, we had a smashing time regardless uh, the fact was we had won the cup yeah absolutely and it was a week, uh, after, uh, a week after we beat Real Madrid in the cup winners cup final we none of us sobered up until the day before the cup <laughs> final you know what I mean so it wasn't a bad result all things considered you know Absolutely. Was that the four-one game where Big Egg curled one from the from the edge of the box? It, it wasn't the four-one game actually. It was a one-nil game. It was a one. It was a one-nil. Um, Eric scored. It was a poor yeah. game. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it was at the end of a long season, and uh, and psychologically, you know, we had played Real Madrid ten days earlier in the height between yeah. the the final and the, the outcome of that, and. The the cup the Scottish Cup final left us all pretty kinda not flat, but you know, we were all puffed out. You know, so yeah. uh you know, to get any sort of win was a good win. But of course that was never enough for uh you know who Peter, Peter yeah. isn't it isn't isn't it great that you <laughs> Mark's talking about Aberdeen beating Real Madrid in the final? <laughs> the younger viewers must be tuned in going, What 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 tuned in here? Amazing. Well, can I can I just tell, can I just tell you something? Uh, you know, amazingly, as a boy, you absolutely 
um, you know, you, you were taking it for granted. Dundee United semi-finals of European Cup, Aberdeen um, battering Bayern Munich. You know, um, it was great, great days. I mean, you just absolutely. That was when I thought the league was absolutely at its most competitive. Um, I don't know if you agree with me on that, Mark. I've got, I've got a, br- I've got a brilliant photo shot on my phone. I'm not start looking for it to show you, but it, it was around that time. And basically, it's a table of, uh, you know, the top teams in Europe. And Aberdeen are the top team in Europe, number one in Europe. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, inc- I, it's incredible. And, and I'm talking about, you know, Real Madrid and Juventus and Inter Milan and Liverpool and all the teams all falling in behind us. We were number one. Yeah, incredible. I still think it must have been. A, I, think, I think it must have been a mistake. I think somebody well. got the table upside down. Or something. <laughs> I think <laughs> you won the you won the European Super Super Cup as well. When you look back at it now, I bet you think one, one day you get into the, you get into the shower and it's a Bobby Ewing moment in Dallas, where it's just been a dream and it hasn't happened. But let me tell you, it was great to see. Uh, those yeah. great Dundee United sides, and of course Aberdeen. Of course, your old mucker. Yesterday it was his birthday. Alex McLeish, sixty-one. Oh, oh, how times are flying. Peter, what, what was the, in, terms of the, right. in terms of the wages, Mark? What was the difference between Celtic Rangers and Aberdeen Dundee? Was there a big, was there a massive com- wage comparison in terms of what you were earning? Well, <coughs> were you I mean, I always remember, I always remember the Dundee United lads. They were always, you know, yeah. angry. Um, because they had a pace, Jim had a pay structure there that was bonus based, you know. So they had sort of things where if they won one game, let's say for argument's sake, they got 100 quid a win. And then if they won two in a row, they got 200 quid. And if they won three, they got 400 quid. And if they won four, they get 800 quid and it doubled. So potentially they were playing some games, you know, that, you know, uh, where they were earning maybe 100 quid a week. They were playing a game on a Saturday for 1,200 quid. You know what I mean? So they had a, an amazing bonus system, but their basic was really low. Um, we had uh, we had a basic system was based basically on that Willie get more than the rest of us, and we shared out what was left. You know? And you know, and Celtic, Celtic and Rangers, you know, sat above uh, both the United and ourselves in terms of being the big clubs, big city clubs that could afford to pay, uh, you know, bigger wages. Yeah. Um, listen, um, St Mirren know what it's all about, Ruffy. They've been over the course before. Um, they only have to look at that fantastic uh, League Cup with Jim uh, Goodwin as the captain. So he'll be able to relay to them uh, a message of what it can be uh, all about. You can be legends in a club. Um, so St Mirren, have they got enough in their arsenal, Ruffy, uh, to upset the apple cart in what is this juggernaut of Livingston at the moment? Yeah, well, I think this is the same as uh, what Mark's saying about St. Johnson. Uh, St. Myrne have proved uh, on any, give, any given night, if they all chip in together, they've, they've proved it against Rangers. They'll all have to do it. It has to, it'll have to be a team effort. And I, I know Livy are on a fantastic run. There's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but I just think something about St. Myrne, I just think that they're, they're due a wee break here and there. But uh, I don't think there's much between the two sides. I think this will go the whole road, uh, and I know they're doing particularly well, but I, I just got a funny feeling for St Martin. I don't know what it is. Yeah, what's your score? Uh, well, it's no, wait a minute. It's it's over ninety minutes, and then the extra time. So I'm yes. going to go one each, and then penalties. So one each will be my score. One each, okay, yeah. and then penalties, and then obviously St Martin to win it. Yes. Okay, Mark McGee, what's your prediction? I think that's interesting because I think there are two games and I think it's maybe probable that one of them will go to penalties. Um, and given that we've already judged the Hibson Johnston game uh, to be won outright by one or other of the teams, it has to be this game. So I wouldn't disagree with that. I wouldn't be surprised if this game... You know, both teams will be wanting to keep it tight. They'll not want to give this game up too quickly. You know, they want to... He stay in the game, and if it goes to extra time, then I think they'll be prepared for that. Um, so yeah, I think uh, once it gets to extra time, then you you know suddenly okay, we'll take penalties. So yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this game ended up in penalties. Who wins the penalties? Well, I think the team that wins the penalties is the ones that are best prepared to take the penalties. Um, and some people say you know you can't prepare in this situation. Of course you can. 
you can go over it and over it and over it and you know in your mind how you're going to take it and you take it well and I think the, the team that's best prepared for penalties will win the penalty. Yeah, strangely enough though, Mark, and knowing you as I do, and we've been out for a right few over the years, I mean long periods of time, and we've been out for pints and had great nights out together. If you if you had waffled on that long without giving me an answer, I'd have probably poured the pint over the top of your head. <laughs> Is there any chance, McGee? Any chance, McGee? Well, tell me. I think it will go to penalties. And then I think that, uh, yeah, do I have to pick one? Yeah. I'm That's going to go. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go uh, for Saint Mary. Ah, oh, there we are, Tom. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the problem is, Tom. I've put McGee in the box next to Ruffy, so that's what's happened. The two of them are yeah. rubbing off he's each other. He's rubbing off. They've yeah, gone, Jack and Victor. Oh, they've gone. They've gone on wee mazes. You know, McGee still thinks he's got the number nine on his back at Aberdeen. And he's on a wee mazy <laughs> and waiting, waiting for Eric Black at the back post. Um, Tom, give me your prediction. <laughs> right, I, I, I'm going to be honest. I, I, I fancy Livingston strongly. I fancy Livingston strongly in this game. I've seen both teams, uh, particularly against Hibs. I thought Livingston were excellent. They're on a great run of form. I really, really fancy Livingston. I'm going to think. I think they win two nothing. Okay, I've gone Livingston to win it 2-1, sneaking it. I've been impressed with the way they go about things. might not be easy on the eye, but they're very direct, and they really work hard on that second ball. So uh, there's your semi-finals. There's your opinions. You might want to give us your opinion, see what you think of the uh, semi-finals. Who's going to make it into the final? Uh, now there are Scottish Premiership games, and Rangers have a chance to extend their lead even further after Celtic slip up in midweek. Um, and, of course, this is a Rangers side that uh, are possible possibly looking at recruiting new players, whether it's in the window or whether Stephen Gerrard is thinking uh, longer term in the summer. Only time will tell if they are able to um, bring in and strengthen the squad. He's got Ryan Jack back in the team as well. Um, I'm looking at Jack Simpson and Namdi Offabor um, from Bournemouth are the latest to be linked, Ruffy. So clearly Stephen Gerrard is thinking, OK, you know, we're well on our way to trying to win the title, but I've got to keep thinking of how... Take the levels up again with Rangers. Yeah, and it's always a feel-good factor when everything's going well for you. That you, you throw a couple of names out there, gets everybody excited. I think every fan likes to see what your your team's doing behind the scenes to bring new players in. But it's the right time to throw something like that out there, uh, and it, it keeps everybody on side. Uh, we don't know if there's anybody going to be leaving. Uh, we'll have to wait and see if that, if that happens. But no, I think it's always a good thing. When if you're a supporter and you pick up the paper and you see that your club is associated with players, not that a lot of people will know who these two players are, but certainly the ones that he has brought in, the experienced ones that he's brought in, haven't been failures at all. Yeah, and of course, um, he, he did admit today that the, the search to improve the squad goes on. Well, listen, the recruitment never stops here. Um, you know, we're always trying to improve and get better. We're always looking at areas of the team and the squad where we can tweak and change and, and, and keep trying to evolve. Um, so, yes, we, we are always looking further down the line. We're always trying to be a window or two windows ahead to try and identify the players that can help us moving forward. Um, but it doesn't make sense while them players are still at other clubs and they've still got jobs to do elsewhere. Yeah, they come up against Ross County, Mark. I know you're down south at the moment. Um, his stock is rising and rising week by week. I mean, I, you look and you see to yourself, they can go 23 points clear. They're unbeaten in 24 straight league games. Um, and already you've got guys like Harry Redknapp co you know, commenting this morning in the papers that, if anything, if he is going to leave Rangers at some point in the future, it should only be for the Liverpool job. And, uh, you know, if your stock's high here, it must be going through the roof down south. What's the feeling like down there? Oh, I think mean, you know how much respect there is from down here, and uh, all eyes were on. You know the the the, 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 the you know him taking the job. In a sense, uh, there were those that maybe doubted that it was a sensible move. You know, but I think that uh, he's proven by the fact that his stock has risen so much being up there um, at a club like Rangers. Um, that it's well worthwhile. Um, I don't think he needs to be in any rush. I mean, you know, there was Brendan, you know, stayed a few seasons at uh, at Celtic, you know, built his reputation further, um, set some records, left, you know, a legacy that other people are 
you know, trying to live up to. Um, and and Steven Gerrard can do the same. He can he can win titles. You know, there's it, 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 there's no reason why he shouldn't be looking at you know a, a, an unbeaten season uh, next season. It, it, you know, those sort of things. The treble. There's all sorts of challenges for him before he has to worry about where he goes next. I think that that one day Steven Gerrard will be the manager of Liverpool. Whether it's Nick, his next job or whether it's one after that, I don't know. But Absolutely, no doubt about it. One day you'll be the manager of Liverpool. Yeah, um, Tam, there was a wee suggestion that the uh, ideal fit for uh, the Celtic job, despite the fact people have stopped taking bets on Eddie Howe, um, one pundit suggested, and I, I raised a little smile on it, um, that maybe John Hughes should have been the ideal candidate. Um, I've got a high regard for John Hughes. I'm not quite sure that's where Celtic are looking at um, for restoring their glory days. Yeah, listen, I think we all get great respect for John Hughes. Um, I think he's done really, really well most of the jobs he's been in. Um, but he's been out of work for a while. I, I think the Celtic fans, no disrespect to Big Yogi, are looking for somebody of a higher calibre. Um, you're looking along the lines of a Brendan Rodgers type character that came in who's proven at the highest level, uh, particularly down south in England. Uh, I think they'll be looking for somebody like that. Uh, and I agree with, I totally agree with, with Mark. I think that Stephen Gerrard will be the manager of Liverpool one day, uh, whether it's now or in a year or two's time, he will be down there because he's done a brilliant job at Rangers. He's driving the standards. You hear his interview there, you know, from a position of strength, it's easy to become complacent. But he's keeping driving it on. You know, there's no time for complacency at the club. They keep improving. They keep looking to see who can come in and improve the team, improve the squad. And I think that's a sign of a really hungry and ambitious manager. And uh, he keeps driving the standards up at, at Rangers. And eventually that will that will take him to the very, very highest level. Yeah, and of course, uh, the manager himself was very complimentary about John Hughes. I think John's got a real big knowledge, especially <coughs> here in Scotland. He knows his players. Um, he's a manager that likes to play football uh, in the right way, and he's certainly gone into Ross County and made a difference. Um, fantastic results against Aberdeen. Probably sent shockwaves through the league, if you like, and they also had a big win uh, away at Hibs not too long ago as well. So this is a team that's very capable on the day. Um, they have had mixed results of late and, and they're in a position in the league where I know they're going to be trying to improve on that. Well, it's his 150th game in charge of Rangers, um, Ruffy, and you know, they're flying high. Uh, we're looking at the stats on this. Uh, I think he could be 10 games away from Rangers being crowned champions. Yeah, I mean, I think anybody saw this season that the Rangers are the team. You know, the, the record speaks for itself, particularly the uh, goals conceded. Uh, and, and they seem to just stroll through games. They're, they're doing what Celtic used to do, you know, even if they went a goal behind. I think everybody knew that they were going to score another two or three eventually. And that's the way the seasons went. Yeah, I think they've away from home. I think teams are beginning to think, oh, we've got a wee chance here. It was proved against Motherwell last week. You know, and, and obviously the, the Celtic game, didn't go Celtic's way, but at home, you know, I know Ross County won four one last week, but if you watch that game when, when Ross County were winning two one, Aberdeen could have had three or four. You know, the goalkeeper had some fantastic saves and then after that obviously they chased the game and lost a couple of late goals. So I'm not going to be fooled by that uh, result last week. I I'm going to go for Aberdeen uh, to win this one two one. 2-1, OK. Um, if anything, I know Roy McGregor is an owner, Tam, likes to back his managers. He will back John Hughes if he's looking to bring players in. But I wonder, because of the current financial climate, if that's to the detriment of his squad at the moment by selling the likes of Ross Stewart. Yeah, listen, I think he's got a decent squad up in Ross County. I think they've got, they've got a large pool of players to pick from. Um, you know, and I think that Yogi will get the best out of them. You know, I've worked under Yogi at Falkirk. I know how infectious a character he can be. And uh, you know, he'll, he'll be up there. He'll get them going. Um, I think he'll keep them up. I think it was a great appointment. And it's I'm just surprised that he was out of the game so long. You know, his last job at Wraith Rovers, I think, was, was poor. But if you look beyond that, he, he had a very good record that likes Inverness and Falkirk and Hibs. So, um, no, I think he'll get the best out of them up there. And, but I don't think they'll get anything at Ibrox. And I think Yogi will go and have a go. And I think that could set it up nicely for Rangers. I think Rangers will win 3-1. Yeah. Um, do, uh, do, were you there at Falkirk uh, under Yogi when he when he when he leathered Simon Stainrod in the shower? No, no, no that, that that was that was well <laughs> before me. But I, I was I, I did play under Yogi at Falkirk, and it was just the way I played with Yogi at Hibs as well, and he hadn't changed. 
He's still the same. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to go on the ring side of him. Tell you that. He had yeah. that fear factor. Uh, well, Absolutely. Uh, I think Mark's trying to get in there. I'm not sure if somebody's turned no, his mic No, I think off. it's me. Oh, oh. I can't oh, believe you've not picked me up in a roughy moment there. Well, yeah, we're, talking about the, uh, <laughs> we're talking about the Rangers-Ross County game and I gave you the Aberdeen score. <laughs> but there you go. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, to look at my notes there, I think. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Is Aberdeen you know, playing Ross County? It, it, so, it, it gets to the point, not only, not only yeah, so. does he make up, if he can't pronounce a player's <laughs> name, Mark, he makes up a player's name. If it sounds like the player, then he'll make it up. But that's why I didn't even bother cross-checking it. Because that. he's, in a, he's so, in a wee world of his own. Yeah. I'm actually going Rangers 3-0. 3-0, OK. Write that down, Tam, because clearly we're all over yeah. the place with yeah. him. Um, what are you, what I, are you I going for? I think Rangers will win 2-0. 3-1 for me. 3-1 in Rangers. Oh, I, I, I think this one will go to penalties. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. <laughs> Who's winning the penalties? I can't. I, it's got to be Rangers. Um, I think the score, in all honesty, when you when you see the score at the end, it might look as if there's been penalties, you know, because I think Rangers will win comfortably. Yeah. Mark, I've got to get your thoughts um, on this next game because. <laughs> uh, suddenly, I think the uh, you know the, it, the it's it, it's a situation that Derek McInnes finds himself under a bit of pressure. Suddenly, now there's a bit of unrest. Um, maybe some people are becoming tired of Derek as the the Aberdeen manager, um, and he's finding that he, he's under pressure. Well, uh, as far as the game's concerned, I mean, I think that you know Aberdeen had that terrible result. Uh, at, at Ross County and Motherwell had a great result against Rangers. So, you know, there's, there's, there's the, the form suggests that Motherwell can do well there. I think, though, Aberdeen uh, will bounce back from that result. And I think that uh, in the end, Aberdeen will win the game. As far as people getting tired of, um, of uh, Derek, I mean, I think it's a results game. You know, if they win on Saturday, you know, convincingly, then he can get on with it. You know, um, these things are cumulative. You know, they they build up against you. You know, and the fans turn against you sort of incrementally, and then it becomes impossible. So I just think that they've got to win on Saturday. Win on Saturday, they can then go on another run, and they can they can put that to bed, and they can fight for the third place or whatever position they're going to finish. Yeah, um, uh, there's there's a training ground at Kingsford. There's now talk that they might look towards trying to get a stadium closer to where they are at the moment. What would you like to see happen, Mark? Uh, sorry, I don't understand the question, Peter. I'm not being well. The, 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 big, I mean, what... the, big, the big talk is they've got the Kingsford training stadium, the the, the training yes. uh, facility. Um, there was talk yes. of building the stadium out there at Kingsford, but there's now. Yeah talk about discussing building a stadium nearer to where Pataudry is at the moment. What would you like to see? What right. do you think is the best move? Uh, well, I wasn't aware of that. You know, I, I am down south and I, I missed that one. Apologies. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the stadium is about access and is about comfort for the supporters. You know, um, it's not about whether it's near Pataudry or wherever it is. I think the best place, you know, that gives the sort of um, you know, like the Brighton Stadium up here, it's out of town. You know, access is fantastic straight onto the motorway. There's a railway station right there. The stadium is sensational. The, every view in the ground is good. That's what they want. And to me, it doesn't matter whether it's near a Pataudry because Pataudry will be gone. Pataudry will become irrelevant. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you to give that opinion. I'm, I'm interested to hear it. I don't know about you, but I, I like stadiums um, that are in the community, at the heart of it. Um, you know, if you go to Real Madrid, it's right there. It's in the heart of it. You know, you, you, you look at the New Camp, you look at Celtic Park, you look at Ibrox Park. I don't know. I'd like to see, I'd like to see Pataudry redevelop, Tom, if they could possibly. I, I think, you know, uh, uh, Peter, I think if they, if they were starting again, Real Madrid and Barcelona and, and all these clubs, they wouldn't build the stadium where they are now. Do you know no, what I mean? I think that, I mean, the, the, you know, it's, times have changed, you know, and I think the, the, the needs of supporters, the transport systems, you know, getting there, the number of cars 
that want to go to a game, you know, is is phenomenal. And having them in city centres where you got to pay somebody to watch your motor and all that is is a thing of the past, you know. You need modern access, modern transport ways, and comfort and safety for supporters. Yeah, and for the benefit of our younger uh, viewers who are watching, um, when Mark and Ruffy were playing, um, basically when we were going to the games, uh, somebody would actually say, can I watch your motor, mister? And <laughs> and sometimes if you were with a parent who was quite gobby, they would say, no, it'll be all right. Uh, to which the young kid would reply, are you sure when you get back here? <laughs> because it could well and truly know. be tanned. It's as simple I don't as know. that, I, I, I don't know if Mark remembers wee Joe Miller's one at Celtic when he used to bring a Rottweiler in his car. Right, he's Rottweiler. And, uh, <laughs> a Rottweiler. <laughs> and uh, obviously the, uh, the message was, oh, if you day into my car, you know, this Rottweiler will tear you to bits. And he came out after training. I see it, and, and, I there was a sign on, uh, and there was a sign on his door saying, can your Rottweiler blow up tyres? <laughs> 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 oh, we, oh, we, oh God! Uh, we, uh, you, which I have to say to you, I don't know if you. I mean, I don't know when's the last time you spoke to him, but um, I, I had a call with Wee Joe about oh, maybe three, four weeks ago, and I came off the phone and the tears were running down my face. Mark, you just, I just could not stop laughing at some of his stories. He is the most infectious character you'd ever want in a night out. Yeah. Uh. And what a good player he was, you know. Um, you know, he's scored a cup winning goal, of course, against Rangers. Um, I flicked it on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing, the thing about it is, nowadays that goes down as an assist. We didn't get assists, you know, we didn't get assists. <laughs> now they're getting transfers on the strength of assists, you know. Never scored a goal in their life, but then 20 assists. You know, well, you got transfer. Uh, you know, they got transfer on the strength of assists. People like Peter Weir would have been playing for Real Madrid. Trust me. Oh, you know? I was just about to say. Me Joe was a good player. Yeah. Well, the other thing about it, I was going to say to you, and I was going to say this to Tam, if you were getting paid according to assists, then Gordon Strachan would have been a multi-millionaire, and then of course. Wait a minute, he is a multi-millionaire, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't really need to worry about it. That's right, it's a, it's a Jack Charlton winner. I wish he had a million pounds for every time somebody said that. Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, do, do, have we given the score? Um, uh, did I give the score on this? I've gone Aberdeen 1-0, Tom. Hey, I'm going to go for two each. I think my can go up there and get a result. I think Graham Alexander's came in. Uh, I think they were underachieving. I think they've got a good squad of players there, and I think you, you'll get them going. I think they'll keep going up there and getting a point, so I'll go for two each. Ruffy? Uh, I'm going to bounce uh, Aberdeen bounce back. I'm going to go Aberdeen 2 1. Yeah. Mark? Well, the same for me, Aberdeen 2 1. Okay, magic. Um, listen, let's have a look at the predictor to see where it's going at. Tam had a right good result in midweek when he predicted 2-2 for Celtic against Livingston. Uh, oh, look at that. Uh, I'm still out in front, Tam, but you've managed to get some right good points. You're on Ruffy's tail. How do you feel about it? It's a long way to go. Hey, Ruffy's, Ruffy's <laughs> you'll flap. He will flap. No, <laughs> he, uh, Peter, can you, can you shout out the scores there? Because I can't see them on my screen. Okay, I'll just give you them once again. I've got 196, you've got 190, yeah, and Tam has got 188. You happy with that? Oh, that's a trip, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's getting mightily close in this predictor. Um, Anyway, apart from anything else, here's what's happening in the Championship this weekend as well, because uh, there are some tasty games. Obviously, Charlie playing tonight uh, for Dundee against our Broth. Uh, And I'm happy, actually, that, uh, you know, the both are in a difficult position, but uh, Dick Campbell is the perfect man for them. If he can duck and dive, um, you know, and get a few players, you never know, he might be able to get them away from that relegation uh, position. And of course, our own pundit, Stevie Naismith, in action for Hearts against Wraith Rovers. What's the game of the day for you, Tom, in that division? Yeah, I think it'll be that one. I think Hearts, Wraith Rovers. Listen, I think Hearts will win that league by 15, 20 points. I think the, the squad is good enough to get in the top six now. In the, in the Premiership, and they should win that league in a canter. But the Rays Rovers have been doing really well. A lot of respect for John McGlynn, 
He always does a good job at that kind of level and uh, he'll give Hearts a, a tough game, but you'd fancy Hearts to win it and, as I said, Hearts will win that league no problem. Strangely enough, though, I think if anybody I was going to bet for second place, Mark, it's it's Dundee on the basis that I think they're just starting to get it together and your old man Gordon Strachan is, is just working his magic as far as being a calming influence and a guiding light towards James McPake, the manager. Yeah, well, I mean, I know the way they do it up there and Gordon, you know, pretty much leaves uh, James to get on with the job, you know, and if James needs to pick his brains, but then he does. Um, I, I think that game's tonight, isn't it? Um, I, I've been I've been Both. watching the Friday yeah. night. Yeah, I've been watching the Friday night games. I've enjoyed that, um, and I think it'll be on obviously, and I'll watch that tonight. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that. But um, I think Dundee, you know, should be able to win that game. I think Hearts in the other game you talked about there, Hearts won't win every single game. But I don't think you can predict the one they're going to lose. So therefore, you've got to back them and say that you know, in this case, they'll win. Um, they'll beat uh, Wraith Rovers. Yeah, and fair play to you, Mark, for admitting openly uh, that you're going to watch our broth against Dundee. Um, Ruffy, no point in asking him what he'll be watching because there could be a rerun on Dave of Bake Off, um, which clearly Ruffy would go back <laughs> over that. He won't be watch. He won't be watching any of broth Dundee. Um, Mark, here's an interesting one. We've all had a tough and worth on it. Um, um, Mo El Yunusi says it's too easy to blame Neil Lennon for the collapse. After talking about all the football, suddenly we're in a situation where we are looking at the carnage um, that has befallen Celtic. Uh, looking from afar, can you believe what's been happening to your old club? Well, of course, it's always spectacular for everybody when something like this happens around a club like Celtic or Rangers, you know. And uh, um, but there has to be a basis to it you know things have happened COVID you know it's affected them um, they have had injuries to key players you know James Forrest for instance has been missing um, you know Bruni is coming to the end of his career and he's not quite the influence he was before so they've not they've not replaced that absolutely momentous player yet you know and and, and, and bring in what he would have brought in previous seasons. So, no, I didn't think it would be as dramatic a, a, a spectacle as it's turned out to be. But, you know, I, I did think that they, they could struggle a little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, Tam, uh, I'll pick up on the point that Mark made there. Uh, Scott Brown, you know, I've had quite a few comments come up on the social media as well. There are, there are a group of people who just don't like Scott Brown, but there are people who are just saying, look, He's been a great captain. He's won all the medals. He's got a CV that's to die for. It's no crime getting old, uh, Tom. Mm -hmm. You know, his, his legs have gone. I don't think he is at the forefront of anybody's anger. I mean, he did a stupid thing in midweek. He was definitely a red card. But Scott Brown has not been the problem. I, th I think it's been a whole catalogue of uh, failings that, you know, have everyone at the point now of calling for the manager's head. Well, not all of them, but quite a few. I think recruitment. I think recruitment's the main one, Peter. You know, the players that Celtic have brought in. You, know, you look at the goalkeeper, £5 million, and the striker, a jetty, £5, £6 million. You know, they've not had any sort of influence whatsoever. And that's, that's a lot of money for Celtic. These guys have got to come in and be an absolute standout in the Scottish Premiership, and neither of them have been. In terms of Scott Brown, you know, Scott, Scott there's no time getting old. He's, he's getting older. You know, he's had a fantastic career. Um, he's doing his, his coaching badges now. He's looking to the next stage of his life, his career. And uh, I don't think he's to blame for this. Um, and the only crime, as you said, is his, his legs have went away. But uh, I, I don't think the lockdown's helped him. I think when you get to 34, 35 years of age, you need to be training every day. You need to be playing every game. You need to be, you need to be working hard. And for him to, to have the motivation, he, he do the, the workouts in the house or go out for a jog at his age and what, he, what he's achieved. I think it's been really tough, and I think that's a major factor in probably his performances after the lockdown when he's not been quite at it. So, listen, Scott's been a legend at Celtic. He's a, he's a key, he's been a key player for years. He's won everything, and I think if Celtic fans are pointing the finger at him, then I think that's wrong. Yeah, Mark. Um, Do Eddie didn't, Howe, didn't, sorry, Peter. Didn't uh, Neil try to replace uh, Rooney two summers ago when he tried to sign John McGinn? Well, it I mean, was actually a it was actually a situation where Brendan uh, was there at that point. Uh, was it and right? They had a chance. They had to, they had a chance to get John McGinn, 
And the uh, I, I don't want to get into the complete background to it, but um, with the unrest that was going on at that time with Brendan in the position as manager and the decision made by the board and Peter Lowell, they didn't get John McGinn. And I, and I think that that was a moment and a, and a real line in the sand where they had the chance to ha- find the perfect replacement for Scott Brown. Yeah. And they blew it big time, Mark. Yeah, well, that, that, that's my point, Peter, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Lenny can't be held responsible for that, neither any more than Brendan can, you know. So, you know, the, the, there was a player like John McGinn. I mean, imagine they'd signed John McGinn then. You're looking at a player, you know, you, you know, regardless of, you know, he would have done better for Celtic, and Celtic would have done better having John McGinn. But the investment would have been, you know, tenfold, you know, in terms of the, the return that they could get in John McGinn. Um, so you know they they have made mistakes as Tam says in in, in recruitment um, and they've, they've, they've suffered because they've had to go further afield. They've had to buy more uncertainty and less with players that come with less guarantees because they're trying to find a type of player that's very very difficult. Yeah, and and the point I was about to make to you, Mark, though, is Eddie Howe. The bookies have stopped taking bets on him. Is Eddie Howe the type of person you think that could? you know, rejuvenate Celtic? Would he be interested in that sort of job? Is it the type of job that would excite him? Eddie Howe is your modern coach, you know. Um, it, many of the sort of same things that, you know, that Brendan would have been doing and practising, Eddie Howe would, would continue that. Um, I don't know that he's the type of guy that's going to come in and turn it around this season. You know, and uh, and suddenly start catching Rangers. I don't know that that's his effect. I think his effect is more um, the longer term, the med- medium to longer term approach, the recruitment, looking at all of that, and uh, and and getting that right again. So I think that Eddie Howe would be a brilliant appointment, but you know, I don't expect them to start winning the league under Eddie Howe this season or maybe next season. I think it would take Eddie Howe time to really implement his methodology. Yeah, uh, and the one key element of this, Ruffy, is everybody's of the opinion that sooner or later, whenever this review comes, that they're going to pull the plug on Neil Lennon. It looks as if it's, I mean, in many people's eyes, a foregone conclusion. Is it in your eyes? Well, the way things are going now, I think Neil would admit it as well. It's not far away. You just look at his body language in the dugout at Livingston when the second goal went in. You have to think that way as a manager, but as I said all, all the way down the line, when you're a manager, uh, you just believe that you can turn. You have to believe that you can turn it round, uh, and and he only knows that uh, winning games can take the pressure off him. When it comes to the end of the season, for me, the board are the only ones that can make that decision. I've, I mean, I know Celtic have had a end end the season, and I know managers get sacked, but see this a results-driven business gets you sacked. I would like to think for a certain extent it's overall what you brought to the club rather than just one season. You know, I th- I would like to think that some people look back and say, well, what has this manager brought to the club in the last five years? I know it's been an absolute nightmare this year, but can this guy get us back to where they were? And that's the biggest decision. I think the divide in the supporters will be a big, big shout as well. That will either gather momentum or, or, or get a wee bit easier. For Lenny, but at the end of the day, it's winning games. Well, that's a contradiction in what you've just said, then, because quite simply, Tom, I think it's beyond that. I think it's beyond that now for for everyone. Yeah, let's do you not, think, I'm, Peter? I'm, do you think Peter, if he, he started going on a run and won the Scottish Cup and, and closed the gap with Rangers, wouldn't be an influence? And in, when you come to a decision. Well, we're not at that point anymore, Ruffy, because people wanted, you know, we look back in the last week, we look back in the last week over key points in the season and what was happening, you know, and, and we already did, you know, we've already actually looked at, um, you know, the, the, the key points in the season where it all failed. You know, recruitment's been a problem. Edouard's been a passenger. <coughs> Griffiths hasn't even been able to kick the ball for him on a regular basis. Um, you had the the more the the ball and, uh, volleyball and goalie situation with the COVID just 
you know, quickly getting on a plane and thinking he wouldn't be noticed uh, at a time when everybody was in lockdown. You had recruitment, which was absolutely poor. You had Shane Duffy um, that, you know, quite a lot of people get excited about, but he proved to be an absolute flop. The list goes on and on. And then you had two wins in 12. Poor European performances, two wins in 12. That's the point when everybody wanted the change. Then we had the debacle over Dubai, which Celtic had to come out and apologise. So at each point, Ruffy, there's been too many things. Yeah. There's no there's no longer, I think, even an eagerness for anybody to say, well, let's see right. what happens all the way to the end of the season. And believe we're me, past that way, stage. I, we're way beyond that now. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. we're, yeah. now we're Peter in a situation of saying to ourselves, uh, what's happening Peter at Celtic? If, Why is there indecision? If we were way beyond that stage, you wouldn't be there tomorrow. No, he wouldn't. But, but by the way, so, Ruffy, so we're not, they're, we're they're, not beyond that stage yet. No, I think I think what's happening is there's no fans in the ground. I think there's a ground swell at this moment, Tam, of fans saying, "What are you doing? Uh, you know, are you going to come out and make a statement? We are all aware that this week coming, that they're apparently going to review his position. So we're now, we've now got bookies taking odds on who's going to come in." And you've now got a situation where Celtic fans are saying, what are you doing? What's happening? That's another draw against Livingston. Yeah. You know, another inept performance, another, uh, uh, you know, sad indictment on the back line who can't defend. And, and up front, you need to score two goals if you're going to never mind win a game, draw a game. Yeah, no, you can't. I don't think you can leave it any longer, Peter. You know, as you said, I think Celtic, you know, I think that's four, four league games without a win. It's the first time in 21 years. Celtic have went four league games without a win. It's, a, it's an astonishing statistic. And I think that we're well past the stage of, of Ruffy's maybe saying, I'll oh, just give him, maybe give him a couple more games. You know, we've, we've kept, I think the board have kept giving him a couple more games to see if it would improve. And it's not improving. I just think Neil Lennon, he's, he's ran out of ideas. It looks as if he's ran out of ideas now. I don't know, Mark, Mark's obviously been a manager. Uh, I, I, I ask a question to Mark. Do you ever, have you ever got to a point, Mark, when you were a manager at a club where you just thought, I don't, I don't know what to do now. I've, I've tried everything, you know, I, and I'm, I've run out of ideas. Did you ever get to that stage at a club where you thought... Absolutely. I, I don't know it's, what to do. yeah. it's several clubs, Tom, where you, you've mm. used all your tricks, you've used all your contacts, you've used all your, your knowledge that you know, you're starting to repeat yourself, and you find yourself with no fresh story. Now, the way people deal with that is that they change the squad, for instance, you know. Um, they get new players in, they get rid of players. You can't always do that, you know, and that makes it difficult. You maybe change your staff. You know, you have a sort of freshen up, you get rid of some of the staff, you bring in new staff to try and stimulate everything and stimulate yourself. But, yeah, of course, and on several occasions I've left clubs, I've went, you know, enough, you know, um, I, I really don't have any more tricks. Um, so, yeah, that absolutely does happen. Whether Lenny's at that now, and the, the club, Celtic is a particular club where... You know, managers would be um, subject to burnout. Celtic Rangers clubs like that because the stress and the pressure of managing these clubs is enormous, and I don't think everyone really realizes that. And he's doing it amidst not only, you know, some bad decisions, but this COVID and all of that. So, you know, I think we've got to be careful. I think he's under he's working under extraordinary circumstances. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think you can reach that point, Tam. Uh, on that point, Mark. My opinion is, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of him as a person. I like him as a person. Um, my opinion is, overall, apart from the fact that I think the recruitment and some of the situations in the background have let him down woefully, I think the players have thrown him under a bus. I think some of them have been absolutely woeful, and some of them are not fit to wear the Celtic jersey. I think that's the problem. And, and when you listen to the manager, and the manager knows it's a results-driven business, but when you listen to the manager on uh, Wednesday, midweek after the game, he's saying, I just don't know. I can't put my finger on what the reason is for this whole collapse. He, even the manager is exasperated with the performance of the players and, and how they just haven't been able to lift themselves. Mm. But uh, I go back again to the circumstances he's working under. Do not underestimate the effect that is having on everybody. And the fact that it's not had an effect on Rangers as badly or it's had no effect is irrelevant. You know, the fact is that it, it, it's had a lot of effect on a lot of people. And it seems to me that the whole absence of crowd and all of that is such a key factor for Celtic, maybe more than, 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 than any other club. And I think that uh, you have to take all that into account. 
you know, what I think Celtic need to do is they need to do some sort of proper audit. Work it out. Who's responsible? Who's made those decisions about recruitment? Who brought in those players? Who who sanctioned them? Uh, you know, been, been playing. How have they been working? How have they been training under the circumstances that they're under? Have they been doing enough? Have they been working hard enough? Have they worked, you know, pre-season, you know, whatever. Look at it and work out who's responsible and then take action. Don't just like, and, and Dermot Desmond and Peter Lawler won't anyway. They're not knee-jerk sort of people. You know, they're going to take a kind of view in it. But I think that's what they need to do. They need to do a proper audit of all the circumstances, of all the squad, of all the staff, of recruitment, of everything, and work out where it's went wrong. Uh, The final point on that, for me, Rafi, anyway, and it's something that a lot of people mention on here, a lot of Rangers fans have mentioned, is quite simply, if there are mistakes, they have been um, under a microscope and, of course, um, blown out when you have a Rangers team that's playing well. I think Steven Gerrard deserves the credit. The Rangers <clears throat> players deserve the credit because they have been relentless. And when you get, Rafi, a Rangers side that's producing performance after performance and increasing the pressure, suddenly every mistake is magnified elsewhere. Second is nowhere in Glasgow. Yeah, but the difference between, for me, between Rangers and Celtic is the team selection. You go over to Rangers and you go, right, who's playing in goals? McGregor. Who's playing left back? Tavernier. Who's the centre half? Golson and Holanda. Who's playing full back? Can't even pronounce his name. But actually, Arasic. 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 <laughs> you go over to Celtic. You go over to Celtic. Who's playing in goals? Uh, Marcus, no, no, we'll not play him. Uh, we'll maybe play Bain. Or, no, no. Who are we going to play full back? Are we going to play Taylor? Are we going to play... No, no. Who are we going to play centre-half? Duffy or somebody else? No. If it, it's that all the way through the team. Who are we going to play up front? Well, he's not available. We've not got any other strikers, blah, blah, blah. The only positive thing for Celtic is their midfield. McGregor, Christie, to a certain extent, and Turnbull. I can't give anybody else any pass marks. For the whole season and for me that's been the difference between the two teams yeah um it's an interesting one um and and, and the fact uh, that you can't deny tam uh, this is a ranger side that are cha- you know champions in all but name as we head towards the end of january uh, and you could hand over the player of the year to james tavernier right now for me mm-hmm. yeah Ruff, ruffy's got a point you know that there's, there's there are numerous players in that ranger squad who've had fantastic seasons Knowing you can get right through the team, and in terms of Celtic, there've been no, no one, no one near it. And you, you'll see at the end of the season, probably for one of the first times, I would think, in a long, long time, not one Celtic player will be a candidate for Player of the Year in Scotland. When was the last time that happened? I think you'll have probably three Rangers players, and maybe, maybe somebody like an or something like that who pops up, maybe gets twenty goals. Nobody, well, not, not one Celtic player will be in. The, in the, not, not, not one Celtic in player in the, will be in the shake-up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just for you the benefit know, of Mark. Been. Yeah, Mark, you were going to say something? I, I'm just going to say that, you know, the most impressive thing for me about Rangers is, you know, uh, Stephen Gerrard's personality in the team, the sort of intensity and the kind of professionalism that they exude. You know what I mean? When you see them running out now and you see them as in a shape and you see the way they go about their business, it just smacks of Steven Gerrard and everything that people imagine that he could bring to Rangers, he has delivered. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, okay, we've uh, offered you as much uh, of our insight into football as we possibly can. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed the show. The benefit of having Mark on, uh, you know, on more than a few occasions as we get a chance just to... Um, uh, one more appearance, I think it is now, Ruffy, for Mark, and he will be available for the staff party when we're all allowed back together. Uh, it's just I one more appearance. It's, yeah, I mean, I think... I've well, not been with Mark, but I've heard good stories. Yeah, well, I have to tell you, <laughs> having been out with them, it's a right good night out, let me tell you. Um, anyway, apart from anything else, it's been great having uh, Mark on, even though he looks as if he's frozen and his face looks as if it's not going to move. <laughs> um, <laughs> nevertheless, and also I was, uh, I was actually about to tell Mark McGee um, that he's not aware of it, Tam, uh, which is quite simply that um, you and Kevin Nisbet are now in a bubble where you live together. Um, he'll not be aware of that. Um, Ruffy, 
if you get a chance, don't forget to forward on who wins the uh, Bake Off on Dave, the repeat for Mark for next week. Uh, anyway, don't forget to follow us. Don't forget to share the stream if you can from time to time. We are absolutely delighted uh, that you join us on the programme. And over and above that, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. We've got a fabulous competition coming up next month. It's not to be missed. It's a hat trick of things. And there's Mark just at the tail end, just as he used to do for Aberdeen. He just cut me off. Well, we cut you off because obviously um, Tam, was frozen was unhappy in time. You, Tam, Tam was unhappy that I informed him you needed one more appearance to make it to our staff party. And he was like, <laughs> get my gee off now. Get, get my gee off now. Um, no, but, uh, I wanted my gee on. <laughs> I've heard, I've heard be, Mark's good company, so I'll get him up for a night. Out. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, have boots will travel. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> that, will be, that will be on your stone, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Our will travel. Fantastic. I'm um, great to have Mark with us. We'll be back with us again. Tam, Ruffy, and myself, Peter Martin. Thank you for watching. Expect the best used car deals guaranteed. Visit arnoldclark.com.